Exodus 24 is where we're going to be today as we pick back up with the Exodus uh, study. If you found it, I ask you to bow your head. Lord God, we just thank you, Father, for the opportunity once again to gather as a family in worship. We ask you to be with us and know in our hearts. Let us hear the thread in this, Lord, and I hope that it would mean something to us when we're done, that we uh, kind of see the Old Testament in a different light and see what you want to happen and want us to see from the New Testament here. So, Lord, we just ask you to anoint our ears and our hearts. Uh, Lord, guide us as we not only go through this service, but as we go throughout the week. And, Lord, I just ask you to work through us and in us and on us and everything else, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, God has always sought to dwell amongst His people. A lot of people don't know it. But that was the reason for creation in the first place. And it wasn't so God had someone to love because the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all have never ceased to exist. That's why they're God, all right? It's because they all have always been. So they always had someone to love. You can't just be by yourself in love. There has to be someone else. So it wasn't so God would have somebody to love in the typical way that's played out. But God said, because he had a family in heaven, a heavenly host, I'll just leave it at that right now, and he said, I want a, I want a different place, and I want a different family to be on earth as it is in heaven, but I'm going to create this place that we call earth. Within that earth, I'm going to create a garden, and gardens and mountains in the ancient Near East are the abode of God. Always have been, always will be. That's why they build ziggurats and temples that are high, and the God always stands up there. Where we are in Exodus today, God is at the top of Mount Sinai, and that is His dwelling for now. Eventually, He'll have a tabernacle, and then eventually after that, a temple. But that is the place He stays. All right? And so He, in the beginning, He created this, created the earth. He creates a garden which we just think of as a place for Adam and Eve to stay. No. Think of it kind of as God's summer home. All right? He stays in that garden. Within all of that language that's used for the garden and the earth as a whole itself is what we call temple language and royal language. And it'll blow, you'll blow right by it in English because it just does Unless you know to look for it, you don't know to look for it. And you just read it like any other sort of narrative. But is, there's temple language there. And Adam and Eve are told to subdue and rule the planet. That is royal language. They are king and queen, so to speak. And the whole earth was supposed to be worshiping Yahweh, all right, as He created, just as they do in the heavenly host. That's what was supposed to happen. Of course, they blew it, all right? And so He exiled them from the garden, from this perfect place. All right? And ever since that first creation moment, you have to understand, that's what he had in mind. And now what we've got going on, especially since Abraham and the building of the nation of Israel, is reestablishing a family, a toehold here on earth, all right, where his word would be worshipped, where he would be uh, king, where he would be the one true God, she is, but they're the only, Israel would be the only ones that really knew that and respected that. And from there, that beachhead, it comes out to eventually the whole planet is worshiping God. So the presence and nearness of God is something that God has always sought and longed for. That's why He walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. That's why He sought out Abraham and would sit there under the tree, you know, and have peanuts and coke with him and all that sort of stuff. That is what he's trying to do. And he's still trying to work that out, but we are in the middle of a big part of a bigger plan of a big story as we come to Exodus. But I hope to show you by the time we're done the way that played out in the New Testament. So if we're not careful, the imagery and the meaning of foreign cultures and stuff is, is often lost on us. So let's start at verse 1. Got a lot of reading here to do, and then uh, we'll come back and talk about it. It says, verse 1, it says, Now he said to Moses, this is God speaking to Moses, Come up to the Lord, 
you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Now, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we took two or three chapters in one shot, and I know it was dry. I did my best to moisten it up. But I know it was dry because it's law. Okay, but here's the deal. If you really start study the law in the Bible, Torah, the way it's supposed to be studied and read, it's not really that dry. There's a lot of stuff that you can get out of it. If you don't see it as statutory law, it's just a dry statute that's been written out, which is the way we read modern law. Um, you know, there's a such thing. Our law, our statutory law, came out of English common law. So, but if you read the law as common law and not statutory law, and not just as this blah, thou shalt not do, and I'll talk about one of those laws here in a little bit, then you understand there's a lot more, there's a lot richer meaning to it. And that was what Jesus was trying to get across when he got here, talking to the Pharisees. He said, dude, y'all have totally hosed this thing up. Y'all have totally made this about statutes and not seen the real application of what happens. And you haven't seen the heart of God in the law. So those two or three chapters that we went through where all the law is packed, not all of it, a good portion of it is packed in there, was called the Book of the Covenant. All right, that's what theologians call that grouping of, of scriptures. And this is the ratification of that covenant that God has made with Israel. Right now what we're seeing, the blood on the altar. They'll have a meal here in a minute. God has given them the law, which, which we tend to equate with, Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Well, once again, if you just read it as statutory law, which is not how they would have read it back then, if you read it, if you read it as common law, it's, it, y- y'all, ever, y'all remember the verse that says, happy is the man who meditates on God's law? You ever read that verse and go, what? Really? I don't think so. Thou shalt not, thou shalt Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm just blessed and happy about all this stuff that I cannot do and I'm not supposed to do. That is not, the reason the verse says happy is the man or the person who meditates on it is because once you meditate on it as common law, it's a lot different than just a bunch of thou shalt nots. But they've been given these laws because they reveal the heart of God. That's what's so important about it. They aren't just dry commandments, but here at this point in time, they actually codify how taking care of people relates to the heart of God. And when we understand them in their context, you won't see this power-hungry ogre of a God. You know, people, I just can't deal with the Old Testament. I just see this mean, angry God. And then, and then you get to the New Testament and Jesus is just sweeter than Jesus. I don't know how you do that. And he's just rocking babies on his knee and he's just forgiving everything and nothing really matters. Well, as soon as you tell me that, one, you haven't read the New Testament not paid attention to, you probably have read the Old Testament but did not see what you were actually reading, okay? Because throughout the Old Testament, God is showing grace. Have y'all thought about this? Think about Abraham and his life. Y'all know how many times he messes things up? How often he goes down to Egypt and, look, honey, tell everybody you're my sister. What did God have to say about that? Not a doggone thing. 
partially because Abraham's acting within the culture. He's not doing something near as illicit as most of us think he's doing. And all the other times throughout Genesis and the Bible that people do things and we're like, oh, and it makes for good preaching about just ripping, roaring, and just shucking the corn and all that kind of stuff. And look at how many times, you know what? God didn't say a doggone thing about it. Which should tell you at least two things. One, he's not as much of an ogre as we think. And two, maybe he didn't say anything about it because in that culture it's not as illicit as we tend to think it is. So we are stop reading it with 21st century eyes. All right? But what you will see if you step back and read the overall narrative is a caring, benevolent creator who's using a people, this people, this nation of Israel that he's built from scratch, who are to be a light to the nations. A people, that a new creation, a people that are to be a light to the nations. Does that sound familiar? I hope so. We're going to get to the point of worshiping from afar later that we read. Um, and that doesn't mean you're standing next to afar. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's why they say, uh, you know, the, the wise men were all firemen because they came from afar. In Mississippi, that's why you say far. Try to explain to somebody how to turn at the far tire. Fire tower. Somebody from up north, they'll, they'll sit there all day. Anyway, it's fun to mess with them, but that's not what we're doing here today. Suffice it to say, all right, that, that worshiping from afar is not what a lot of us think. I've heard it preached, you know, oh, they're scared. They don't want to be close to God, so just leave them back there. Not at all the case, all right? Moses told the people what was in the law right here, what we just, he goes over that with them, and the people agreed to follow it. And this was, this is what, this is a legal section right here. This was their chance to reject it if they chose to do so, but they agreed to it. And we always, most of us basically knowing the story, go, yeah, yeah, there they go. Go ahead and say yes. We know they're going to blow it. That bunch of losers, stop. Because if we had been there, we had done the same thing. All right? There's fire and smoke on the mountain, you know, fire on the mountain, lightning in the air, gold in them hills. All right, that's a good song. You picked up on that. But the point is, there's all this is rumbling and going on. God is manifested at the top of this mountain, and it's not Everest we're talking about here. It's high up there. He's sitting there. Moses comes down, and they've seen all these things. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt, and they say, yes, we'll do it, that they want to do it. Can they do it? No. That's the story of the whole Bible. That if the plan of God is going to get carried out, God's going to do all the heavy lifting. Because we're going to fail Him. That's just the way it is. And sometimes He has to step in and sometimes He doesn't say a word. Alright? But this is their chance to reject it. But how could they reject a covenant with a God who delivered them from Egypt and was currently manifesting His presence at the top of the mountain before which they're in camp? So don't look at them, please, as just agreeing, knowing they're going to fail, because that wasn't the case. I believe they were sincere on the whole. And once again, are we any different? Yes, Lord, I want to live for you. you know. And a lot of us don't make it out of the parking lot before we messed up. That's just human nature. We need to realize also that there was grace built in the law when it was read as common law and not just statutes. Deuteronomy 25.4, all right? This is known as an ox law. If you read a lot of this, there's a lot about oxen in the law, okay? A lot of ox laws or oxen laws. But it says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, okay? Now, this is what's going on. So we go, oh, doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't own an ox. I don't have grain. I don't have to fool with it, all right? It has nothing to do with me. Well, I chose this one because there's a New Testament reference to it where the Apostle Paul shows the way this is supposed to work. If back in those days, one way, once you harvested your grain to get the seed off of the the plant and all that kind of stuff, was you throw it out in this little circle thing. You have an ox tied to this. you got a uh, yoke hooked to his neck and to a spindle there in the middle, and he walks around and around and around, trying not to fall off the stage here. He walks around and around, round and around, round and around, round. I'm not doing that because I get dizzy, but he keeps walking and he crushes this 
until, and then you separate the wheat from the chaff, and eventually it's a way to grind the meal down. But the ox said, the law states, don't muzzle the ox that treads your corn or your grain or whatever the case may be. What's it talking about? He's working, so he's got to eat. So don't put a muzzle on him, because every once in a while as he's walking around this, he's going to need to bend over and eat from what he's crushing and making. And God says, that's the way it should be. Don't oppress the one that's doing the work for you, if you have employees or what have you. Now, uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 7 through 12, look at the Apostle Paul as he talks about this. Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock, do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? And that's the point. If you read it as just a statute, it's all about an ox and corn. But if you read it as common law, then it's about people too. You don't take advantage of people. You don't work them into the ground. You make sure that they're fed. You don't, like I said, you don't uh, take advantage of them. Is, God, sir, is, is it oxen God is concerned about? Verse 10, or does he say it all together for our sakes? Common law. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he who plows should plow in hope. And he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. He should get some of the fruit. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Now, this is not a ploy for, for money for me. That's not this is what this is about. I want to show you how the law is supposed to work. It's not a statute just about an ox. It is a common law that encompasses all of humanity, that when someone, someone's doing something for you, you don't take advantage of them, no matter who they are. You let them eat. You let them drink. You provide them with the tools they need. All right. You don't tell them to make bricks and you've got to go get your own straw. Y'all get this? Y'all see how this is more than just a statute about an ox? This is about people and relationships. You give them what they need. All right? That, now, if you take that principle and go back through the, the book of the covenant, Deuteronomy and all the other Leviticus, where the law, the 611 or 613, depending on how you want to arrange them, are written and read it as common law, then you start seeing the heart of God. Because the ox law is not just about an ox, and this law is not just about this or that. It's all encompassing. So the Apostle Paul here shows us what the, how it was to be uh, used. Then as we get into a little further into the story that, we're, that we are reading today, Moses then sprinkled this blood of the sacrifices on the altar as well as the people. Blood was seen to be the life force of all living things. It was also uh, seen to be a cleansing agent. Now at this point, this sacrifice here is something of a ratification of the covenant. All right? But I wanted to show you something because of the language that we read over in this particular passage in a few chapters earlier that I mentioned is most of the time, we had this, I had a little this conversation yesterday, most of the time when I ask people, what are the sacrifices at the temple that will be in the future here, what are the sacrifices when they bring up a lamb or a goat and they slit the throat and pour it out on the altar? If I ask people, what are those sacrifices for, they'll go, Oh, for people's sins. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. The only sacrifices at the temple that were for people's sins was that when they used a scapegoat. They would sacrifice one goat, then they lay their hands on another goat. That was a scapegoat. And symbolically would place all of the sins of Israel on that goat, and then they'd run it off in the wilderness. And pray to God he didn't come back. Because he's supposed to you know, be carrying the sins with him. Later on, what they do is they follow the goat and make sure he doesn't come back. If you catch my drift, kick him over a cliff or something, put a cap in him, anything, so he doesn't come back in because people will be freaking out. That's the only uh, offering 
in the law that deals with personal sin. Everybody goes, so what was it for? What was it for? For the most part, those, all those sacrifices, when you would come down, like Jesus did, you come down and you would bring your Passover, you would, you would give, uh, get the lamb and all this, and you would sacrifice and come to the temple and all this sort of thing. That was, that goat or lamb was sacrificed, or ox or what have you, or cow, bull, or whatever. Well, that is sacrificed to cleanse the temple. That was what it was for. To cleanse the temple. Why? Because the temple is where God lives. And the temple gets polluted because you've got the priests and everybody and the general public coming around it all the time. So that is to cleanse the temple, not the individual of sin. Now keep that in mind as we start going through this story. All right? It's, it's, if, if you put it there on the shelf, it's going it's to mean something to you here in the end. All right. Look at verse 9. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, the seventy and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel he did not lay his hand, so they saw God, and they ate and drank. So there's a meal that helps to ratify the covenant. Also in verse 10 there, when it talks about that sapphire paving, you need to go back to, uh, I think it's Ezekiel 28, where they're talking about the Garden of God, all right, Eden. And you have this Edenic imagery, and it's temple imagery, and these pavements. And you see the same thing in the book of Revelation. This is where they're getting a glimpse of God at the top of the mountain, and then all of a sudden they see this, you know, under the smoke and stuff, the way I imagine it, all right, is they got smoke and kind of it comes up off of the floor, and they can all of a sudden see this pave work pavement of stones, all right, it's symbolic, but what they're seeing is, it's an image of heaven and the throne room, and it shows that God is up there somewhere, once again, you see the same thing in the book of Revelation, you see the same thing as the Garden of Eden is described also, verse 12, then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone, and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them, so Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. So, here we go. If you don't know, if you don't know to watch this, we're just reading through it and reading over it. But there are divisions of the people going on here. Okay? That's the first thing you have to understand. Automatically, flags should go up. Tabernacle language or temple language. Look carefully at the divisions of the people. Only Moses and some of the elders were allowed to approach the mountain and climb any part of it. The people as a whole were to remain at the base of the mountain in the camp. And they had these little things set up that you weren't supposed to come past it and even touch the mountain. Or you'd be killed and we go, good grief, God, that's mean. There's a reason for it. There's a type here. There's some symbolism going on, all right? The elders, uh, uh, the elders were permitted to ascend up to a point with Moses and Joshua, and then Joshua could go for a little way up the mountain past the elders, but only Moses could go into the cloud where the presence of God was being manifested in His power and glory. And some of these guys partially up the mountain are able to see this pave, pavement of stone which signifies the throne room of God, okay? Something like that. That's what we're getting to here. And they're able to see a part of it, but it's only Moses that gets to actually walk in there and really talk to God, all right? This is temple language. What do you mean by that? Because, well, let me try to explain it. When the temple is eventually built, there is an outer court where the majority of the people are allowed to go and go no further. All right, you had a special place. Gentiles could come up so far. You got this big outer court that anybody, essentially, especially this Israelite, can come up to it, but they can go no further. This is the base of the mountain, symbolically here. The base of the mountain is equated to the outer court. Then there was an inner court where the priests and the Levites could go, 
This is the lowest part of the mountain where the elders and Joshua are allowed to go. But only Moses could ascend to the top of the mountain to be in God's presence, which is akin to the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go. And then he could only go in there once a year because it's the most sacred of sacred space. It was the throne room of God. As the Ark of the Covenant's in there and you've got the cherubim sitting there and it's God's throne in His footstool. And only the high priest could go in there. And what you have to understand about, let me ask you this question. How many of us can name any kings of Israel? All of us can probably at least name one. David. Saul. Saul, David, Solomon. Then you got Jeremiah. All right. All the, you got all these dudes, all right, the northern southern kingdom, they split, and there's war, and you got this and that. All right. So we all got it, all right? You, you proved my point. We can all name uh, a king. How many of us can name a high priest, especially in the Old Testament? It's not a high priest. It's not the same thing. Levites, the tribe. The point is, you can't. We're never really given a name specifically. You might have Aaron. You know, you can get Aaron as part of that, but he's not. He hasn't assumed that identity. That's the point I'm trying to make. Is this that the high priest? It really doesn't matter who it is. If you're coming on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, it doesn't matter who the high priest is. You just got to see the high priest. The high priest in Israel's law is above the king. There is an allowance for the king, all right, in Deuteronomy. They kind of say, all right, and we know you're going to hose up and want a king, and here we go. The high priest can hold the office of a king, or he can do as the king would do, but the king can never hold the office of the high priest. Because the high priest, this king is always subservient to the high priest. The high priest is the only one that can go into the most sacred space and talk to God. He is almost, he's not only a representative to God of God, he's almost a type of God. Because he is the one that works out all this, all these sacrifices and image, imagery, all right? So the, the high priest is very important. You can't name any one of them because it didn't matter. It's an office. It doesn't matter that it's high priest Fred or high priest Joe. That doesn't matter. But there is that office. All right? So the Israelites, the high priest was more highly thought of than the king. So we have temple language here. That's the point I'm trying to get across. A preview of what is soon going to be manifested in the building of the tabernacle and eventually will culminate in the building of the temple. A house of God whereby he is able to live among his people as I talked about back in Eden. So it's reestablishing that. You see, he started in Eden, it's messed up. And now we're, we're kind of taking, he's taking another run at it. And there's tabernacle, and then the temple, and then the temple's going to be destroyed. There's good reason for that. Look at verse 16. Y'all just, you've gotten the basic point, this is tabernacle, or king, uh, temple language. Look at verse 16. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. All right, just a quick thing about numbers right here. Don't try to make a build a whole doctrine off of it. Please. Please don't. Six days link back to creation. All right. After six days, Moses goes up there. Six days of creation, God is doing some sort of work. Some people, maybe he's carving the the the, uh, the, the, the tablets right there and whatever. But any, at any rate, the pattern you see is that after six days, God invites Israel to be in on the Sabbath because that's when the king would sit on his throne and enjoy all that he would survey. That was the, one of the original meanings of the Sabbath at the creation. And, and God in the law invites Israel to join him in that. So now we have six days mentioned. That's a special number to the Hebrews. Um, and, and then Moses walks in. You got him up, that he was up there for 40 days and all that. The number 40. Usually linked to a time of testing. 40 days and 40 nights. All right? Uh, the flood, 40 days and 40 nights. The temptation in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights. 
That's just a number. I don't honestly think it's always a literal 40 days and 40 nights. I'm not a liberal, I'm not a heretic, but I just know how the numbers are used. And that's what it means when they write it down. All right, so we see all that. But where does all this lead us? Where do all these numbers and all this temple language lead us? What is your point, Fox? What are we getting past here? All this, you're boring me again. But if Israelites were making pilgrimages to Jerusalem in order to sacrifice, everything was to take place at the temple. Understand that. Everything was to play, take place at the temple. The high priest was whom they were to see. The high priest performed a messianic role. Now when the nation of Israel split into the house of Israel and the house of Judah, they split due to taxation among a couple other things. The king of the northern kingdom said he was tired of his people traveling south to Jerusalem to the one and only temple to sacrifice. I'm going to lose people. If they keep going down there to go to church, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to build one here in the southern end of the kingdom and one way up at the northern end of the kingdom. I'll build a temple here and a temple there, and they can worship there. What was wrong with that? What does the temple represent? The what? presence of God. And God was only to reside in one temple. So when we, they start building other temples, God ain't there. They're not worshiping God. And you see what they're doing. They, they're combining a bunch of paganism, which Israel did throughout their history. But the northern kingdom really takes it to a different level. So you've got these other temples, and God's not there. Is He omnipresent? Yeah. But it represents, this is the one He said, you build this and I'll be there. And when the northern kingdom is established, they just build their own and say, we'll do it our way. It might work for Frank Sinatra. It's a great song, but it's not any way to live. And so, um, when you build God His own residence, He doesn't show up. It doesn't matter what you do there. But for those, even in Jesus' time, they're accustomed to offering sacrifices. They have to come down to Jerusalem to have this done. Why? Because the presence of God was there. The high priest was there. All of that is done there. All right. That's God's residence. Mark 1. Verses 14 and 15. They'll be there shortly. There they go. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, which is north of Jerusalem, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Underline that phrase, is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, I'm not going to go off on a tangent about how Jesus teaches the gospel and the gospel and what we think of the gospel is usually only a part of the gospel and not really all of it. I'm not going to do that today because I'll get mad. All right, but that's what has happened here. But look at this. Jesus is in Galilee. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom and he declares the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's go back to the beginning for a second. Adam and Eve were told to subdue the earth, to rule over it. That's royal language. They were kind of the first original king and queen. They were the icons created. All right, That was their purpose. They messed up. And everything in the Bible since is trying to get back to that ultimate reality. This is the context for the kingdom among the Israelites. This is kingdom and temple language. God coming to reign was played out in the temple in its rituals. Did I make sense of that? Maybe I didn't. The high priest performs the messianic role. All of the stuff that he's doing within the temple, which is a microcosm of Eden. That's what it looked like in there. And, and the high priest is performing the rituals. He is a messianic role. He is God in that temple. Stands for God in that temple. Working with God in that temple. Everything happens in that temple. All right? Understand that. And then Jesus says, the time is at hand. Which is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word that's translated to draw near. You go, all right, so what? Hang with me. You can geek out on this stuff if, if you really like. But it refers to, to, the time is at hand, does refer to time, meaning to be near. But it also refers to when people went to the temple to sacrifice, they did it. 
in order to draw near to God and His presence in the temple. So Jesus uses the same language. His time is at hand. The time for you to draw near is here. They would have heard it this way. The drawing near is always equated to God and His presence in the temple. All right. Now if you read what Jesus does in the Gospels, He declares that the time is drawn near, but we also have to look at what He says and does. Because along with this declaration that the kingdom is drawn near, He also heals the sick, He casts out demons, and He forgives people of their sin. And the Pharisees trip out on this. Why? That's the first read, yeah. Only God can do it. But not only that, it's only done at the temple. And then Jesus walks into Galilee and says, draw near. Draw near to the presence of God. Because that's who He is. And then He starts doing what's only supposed to be done at the temple. Out in the country. Himself. Now that's why they're really tripping out. Okay? The Pharisees take umbrage at all this. All right? And they, they, they trip out. Because only God forgive, can give sin. And this was done through sacrifice through the office of the high priest at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus healed the sick. That had to be confirmed through the priesthood. He was casting out demons, which was normally done through the priesthood. And all these things were normally done at the temple. And now Jesus is doing all these things apart from the priesthood in Galilee, away from the temple. How could He do this? He could do it because the temple was supposed to be the house of God. But Jesus was and is God. And He moved out of the temple and nearer to His people. That's what you need to take home today. At this point in history, the New Testament, Jesus is moving out of the temple and into His people. They don't have to come to Him. Uh, he goes to them now and to, in order to draw near. The presence of God, God Himself, was now going out among His people, which is what God wanted in the first place when He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. That's the meta narrative, or part of it, that ties this whole thing together. In 1 Corinthians 3 and 6, Paul tells us that now we are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit now resides within us. Which to me makes the case there never needs to be another temple built. And that's going to stir up more devils than cast out. But the point is, I believe that's why Jesus allowed to be destroyed in 70 AD. There's no need for it now. Because God has moved out among His people and now those that are believers are the temple. He's in them. And as you walk around the presence of God and the temple of God, the imager of God is now covering, imagers, plural, of God, are now covering the planet. In Exodus and throughout the Old Testament, God resided in a temple made with hands. And eventually the whole earth, as a new heaven and new earth, will be His temple as it was supposed to be in Genesis. God lived among His people in a temple, garden, or mountain. All throughout from the beginning of creation, throughout the Old Testament, into technically the New Testament up to 70 A.D., and only certain members of the priesthood could come near Him so as to limit the pollution of humanity coming in the temple. So there was this issue of, as we read, the first verse or so in Exodus 24, of worshiping God from afar because of our pollution. But Jesus, as the high priest, as the manifest presence of God, moved out of the temple and dwelt among His people. And now all of a sudden, it's not the pollution that's getting transferred to Jesus at this point. He is cleansing people. He is transferring His purity to the people. Now if you're walking around in the day and time, that is a big deal. And it should be to us also. But that's the imagery. That's what people are seeing in Jesus' day all the way back in the Old Testament time. That now, that to me just... Not some cute little Bible story. That's what is actually happening. His presence became nearer than ever before when Jesus comes out. And now for the believer, His presence is even closer 
And then it's in that it's in each of us. We are the temple. And in that, God's presence never leaves us, but it also moves around this present world through us as we are disciples and are to make disciples. Never doubt the presence of God. In fact, the believer... For the believer, you cannot deny the presence of God unless you deny your own existence. For the believer. From the beginning. Because this is what concerns me, is that people read the Old Testament and it's just kind of weird. And it's this ogre God is just hurling lightning bolts down and killing people and opening up the earth and swallowing them whole and blah, blah, blah. And then... They want to make Jesus as some little sissy guy bouncing around the country frolicking through the tulips and the poppy fields who, you know, well, they're just trying to make him light in the loafers, I think. But the point is, they're the same. And if you know how to read it and what you're reading, you see the same thing but with different symbolism. So from the beginning, God is sought to be present in and among His people. And Jesus has shown us how that works. We are on the kind of the tail end of that working itself out. So remember this when you're reading the law and other Old Testament books and see how He is near you, even within you now. That is the vivid imagery that the Bible wants to portray to you. There was a God who created mankind in order that He could enjoy them and they could enjoy Him. They could hang out together. Still reverence and worship and all that. They could hang out together. He wanted to sit and walk and talk with us. And then that was messed up. And he starts with Abraham and starts this whole thing over. And we see the beginnings of it on the mountain. And then in the tabernacle. And in the temple which essentially comes all the way through Jesus' day. And then Jesus takes that Instead of going to Jerusalem, he says, I'm here amongst you. Draw near now. The presence is here. And you don't have to worry about polluting his temple. He said, I'm here to cleanse you. That is the good news to the poor and the downtrodden to whom Jesus was ministering in the Galilee. It's part of it. And it's good news to us. And it's part of it's a lot more of the gospel than just justification that everybody's trying to always get you to make a decision and get butts in the seat. It's not about decisions, it's about disciples. And that's why the church has failed, I believe. But know this God has always sought to, to be amongst his people, a living, loving presence. So the worshiping from afar, see the context in which that was done, and now understand that there's no need for it anymore. Would y'all bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you once again, Lord God. And Lord, I know we're in it's a little dry here and there. Is, is our minds just aren't accustomed to, to dealing with this sort of literature. But Lord God, it is so rich. There's no way anyone who has truly studied this book can say it was simply written by a bunch of men It is too interconnected, too interwoven. There are simply too many layers. Lord, I thank you for that. For the words you've sent us, Lord God, and how it just can change our lives. Lord, forgive us for not teaching all of the gospel. Lord, but I do pray that today we will understand more We'll understand a little bit better about your presence and that we'll know how badly you want to be with us, that you're not just sitting at the top of the mountain throwing down lightning bolts and scolding and all that. You have worked throughout the entirety of history so you can be with us and we can be with you. Father, I just ask we chew on that this week and see especially the God of the Old Testament, a little differently. And we thank you once again for your mercy, Lord, and your grace, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.